Cuban Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez called for cooperation and solidarity to overcome the global health crisis during the 25th Ordinary Meeting of the Association of Caribbean States Council of Ministers. The Director General of the World Health Organization warned on Friday that the COVID-19 pandemic is accelerating fast. The Africa Regional Certification Commission is set to certify the continent free of wild polio virus in August 2020. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the South and I'm Katrina Goss. Cuban Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez speaking during the 25th Ordinary Meeting of the Association of Caribbean States Council of Ministers praised the association's actions to combat the coronavirus pandemic. He also called for cooperation and solidarity to overcome the global health crisis. COVID-19, whose epicenter has shifted to the U.S. and whose effects seriously threaten Latin American and the Caribbean countries, has generated a huge health crisis which represents a threat to life and confirms the need for cooperation and solidarity to face the pandemic and the growing challenges arising from it. And the Cuban foreign minister strongly rejected the inclusion of members of the Association of Caribbean States on lists of non-cooperative countries. I reiterate Cuba's rejection of unilateral lists and certifications that affect countries of this association just as Cuba rejects the inclusion of member states on the non-cooperative jurisdiction list and calls for a constructive dialogue in this respect. UN Special Representative for Haiti, Helen Lalime, addressed a virtual meeting of the Security Council today, where she said the COVID-19 pandemic was worsening the already dire economic and humanitarian situation in the country, stretching Haiti's already fragile healthcare system and testing the country's social safety net. In the absence of adequate resources to support Haiti's emergence from the recession in which it is plunged, the hard-won security and development gains achieved over the course of the past decade and a half risk coming undone, and a primarily domestic problem could transform into a regional issue should an already alarming humanitarian situation continue to worsen and increasing numbers of Haitians be tempted to seek better fortunes abroad. The vicious circle of mistrust, recrimination, and ultimately violence is once again starting to define the dynamics of Haitian politics at a time when the entire society should be unified in its response to the pandemic and striving to lay more virtuous and lasting foundations on which to build its future. Mexico remains one of the worst hit nations in Latin America where the daily struggle to contain the COVID-19 epidemic continues. Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador concluded a regional tour in the city of Cuernavaca on Friday where he inspected work on a hospital that's been renovated to treat coronavirus patients. The president noted in a press conference that Mexico's health system was ready to face the pandemic as enough medical staff were now in place. According to Johns Hopkins University, Mexico has reported more than 165,000 positive cases and over 19,000 deaths. This way we are moving forward because now we already have specialists and doctors. I also have the information that we have been able to save more and more lives of those who enter hospitals and intensive care. Demonstrators took to the streets in Guatemala against possible new coronavirus restrictions. Protesters drove in a convoy, honking their horns and waving flags. The demonstration came after the government's announcement last week that it was considering plans to impose more lockdown restrictions if the number of new cases continues to increase. According to Johns Hopkins University, Guatemala has reported more than 11,000 positive cases and over 400 deaths.
Venezuelan Minister for Communications Jorge Rodriguez offered a report on COVID-19 figures on Friday. Rodriguez reported 19 locally transmitted COVID-19 cases, two deaths and 87 imported cases in the last 24 hours, of which 60 cases came from Colombia, nine from Brazil and 18 cases were people who had contact with others who had returned to the country from other countries. Venezuela's COVID-19 figures now stand at more than 3,000 positive cases and 28 deaths. The Chilean capital has become the fourth most affected city in the world by the COVID-19 pandemic. The metropolitan region where the capital Santiago is located has recorded almost 188,000 cases, which is more than 80% of the country's tally. According to a study by John Hopkins University, the four most affected cities in the world are New York in the United States, Moscow in Russia, Sao Paulo in Brazil and Chile Santiago. Brazil's controversial education minister Abraham Wentrub announced his resignation amid the deepening political crisis surrounding the Jair Bolsonaro administration. Well known for his aggressive behaviour, Wentrub made racist comments regarding China, Brazil's main trading partner, and suggested that Supreme Court judges should be imprisoned. His resignation coincided with the arrest of far-right figures linked to a corruption network reportedly managed by the Bolsonaro family. The current political crisis sees far-right President Jair Bolsonaro pitted against the Federal Supreme Court and the National Congress with a series of allegations of electoral fraud, corruption and fake news befalling the President and his closest allies. Welcome back to From the South. The Director General of the World Health Organization warned on Friday that the COVID-19 pandemic is accelerating, noting that over 150,000 new cases were reported on Thursday, representing the highest number in a single day since the beginning of the outbreak. Meanwhile, the Americas reported half of the new COVID-19 cases, while South Asia and the Middle East regions are now emerging as COVID-19 hotspots. The world is in a new and dangerous phase. Many people are understandably fed up with being at home. Countries are understandably eager to open up their societies and economies. But the virus is still spreading fast. It is still deadly. And most people are still susceptible. <clears throat> we call on all countries and all people to exercise extreme vigilance. This Friday, the Venezuelan popular platform Against the Blockade gathered in a video conference to discuss the challenges people in the United States are facing due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The forum featured a talk by Karina Garcia, member of the board of directors of the Damayan Migrant Workers Association based in New York. It also saw the participation of Willie Baptist, co-coordinator of Poverty Scholarship and Leadership Development for the Cairo Center, which works for human rights and social justice, also based in New York. Further speakers included Hernan Vargas, member of the Continental Secretariat of the Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of Our America and a member of the Venezuelan Settlers Movement. And Karina Garcia, a member of the Board of Directors of the Damayan Migrant Workers Association, noted that young people in the United States have realised the importance of taking action in order to make a real change in the country. There are lots of young people in the United States that are realizing that they have won more in the last 10 days through protests than in the last decade, while we were trying to get votes for this or another political party. They are realizing the votes are not going to change the current economical and social situation we are facing. People have seen how we're important for our own survival, and this gets to their conscience. The government's incapacity, government's cruelty, and the discovery of the power of poor people and the workers is amazing. I think this experience is important for new leaders that can really make a change in this country, besides Democrats and Republicans, even further, to fight against imperialism and capitalism. Meanwhile, social movement leader Hernan Vargas called for a united struggle and praised the forum as a space for important debates. It has been an hour of a very important debate because it allowed us to know United States people's fight, the current situation in this country, which is important for us from Venezuela. We think this opens a debate space about so many other topics, such as the Afro movement fights, Latin America's unity, sexual diversity, feminism, workers' class fight against their racism, 
fight against imperialism, the fascism, militarism and wars, and all those important topics that are important to debate in order to construct a people-to-people -people relation. Spanish authorities have seized 3.8 metric tons of cocaine at the port of Valencia as drug smugglers presumed police would be off guard during the COVID-19 pandemic. According to a statement by Spanish police, the investigations began in April after a tip-off from the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency and Homeland Security Investigations. The cocaine was found in six containers which had arrived from Latin America and was concealed in various ways, including inside bags of sugar, barrels of pineapple pulp and among Californian walnuts. The police arrested 11 people, including eight Spanish nationals, two Dutch and one person from Ivory Coast, while some port workers are also suspected of being involved in the scheme. Russian President Vladimir Putin has called to fully repair the environmental damage caused after 21,000 tonnes of diesel oil were spilled from a power plant in Norilsk in late May. It's necessary to not just quickly clear the mess, but to ensure high-quality recuperation of soil and waterways. This is why the strictest oversight is needed in the liquidation of the consequences of the disaster. Obviously, the disaster has brought dire consequences for the environment and severely impacted by adversity in water bodies. It will take a lot of time to reclaim and restore the environment. The employees of the Nolsic Nickel Company must continue to clean up work until the damage is completely eliminated. The UN Refugee Agency has partnered with Twitter and a 22-year-old Ivorian artist to launch the 2020 World Refugee Day emoji. Ivorian artist Grebet Opleleu designed the emoji representing two hands linked together in the shape of a heart. According to the artist, he wanted to create an emoji that represented diversity and solidarity. World Refugee Day is marked on June 20th each year and celebrates the courage and resilience of the tens of millions of people across the world forced to flee their homes due to war or persecution. I hope that this emoji will inspire people to show more solidarity and accept each other's differences. This emoji is based on three key UN refugee agency values, diversity, acceptance and solidarity. To represent that, I thought of putting together two hands of different colors that make the shape of the heart. And we're taking one last very short break now, so stay with us for more. Welcome back to From the South. The Africa Regional Certification Commission is set to certify the continent free of wild poliovirus in August 2020, as final documentation on the matter has been handed over by Cameroon, the Central African Republic, Nigeria and South Sudan. The commission is mandated to certify the eradication of wild poliovirus in all 47 countries in the WHO Africa region. WHO Regional Director for Africa, Dr. Matsishiriso Moeti, extended congratulations to the four countries, stressing that their achievement is a major step towards wild poliovirus eradication. The Commission previously received poliovirus figures from 43 countries in the region. If the free of wild poliovirus status is granted, the African region will become the fifth of six WHO regions to be declared free of the virus. Thousands of people have taken to the streets in Mali to demand the resignation of the president. Tens of thousands protested in the capital, Bamako, calling for the ousting of President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita. The demonstrators reject the president's handling of the violent insurgency that emerged in the northern part of the country in 2012. A slow pace of political reforms, a struggling economy and a perception of government corruption have also increased opposition to the president. Health authorities reported 541 new COVID-19 cases in Kuwait on Thursday, bringing the total number of confirmed cases to over 38,000. Kuwait's Health Ministry spokesperson Dr Abdullah Al-Sanad noted that 283 cases were nationals and 258 were residents of other nationalities. The death toll in the country stands at 308, while 188 patients are admitted at different medical institutions. Meanwhile, over 29,500 patients have recovered from the virus. 
Presidential elections are set to take place on June 23rd in Malawi after the 2019 election results were dismissed by the country's constitutional court. The Electoral Commission noted that around 6.8 million Malawians are eligible to cast their vote at over 5,000 polling stations. The Constitutional Court stressed that widespread, systematic and grave irregularities were committed in the May 2019 elections and called for new polls within a period of 150 days in March. Meanwhile, three candidates are running for the presidential office, among them Peter Mutharika of the DPP, Lazarus Chakwera leading the MCP and Peter Kuwani heading the MMD. Palestinians living in the Jordan Valley are afraid of losing their land and being unable to access their crops if Israel continues with its illegal annexation plans. The Jordan River's shorelands, which were used for grazing, have been usurped by illegal Israeli settlers. Palestinians in the area are forced to work for the settlers for about $3 an hour. US President Donald Trump proposed the annexation plan as part of his so-called Middle East peace plan. The plan has been widely rejected internationally as it undermines Palestine's right to self-determination. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced that the annexation process is set to begin on July 1st. Egyptian authorities called on the United Nations Security Council to mediate in the dispute over the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam on Friday as the latest talks failed to reach an agreement. The Egyptian Foreign Ministry highlighted Article 35 of the UN Charter, which grants authority to the Security Council to settle disputes that might endanger international peace and security. The request comes after recent talks between Egypt, Sudan and Ethiopia came to a stalemate. Ethiopian authorities have pledged that the dam project is intended to improve its electrical power generation, while Egypt and Sudan have argued it threatens important water supplies. Chinese authorities have begun the formal prosecution of Canadian citizens Michael Korvrig and Michael Spavrov, accused of espionage. The case known as the two Michaels has drawn international attention since 2018, when the two were arrested for stealing and illegally providing state secrets for foreign countries. According to the indictment, defendant Michael Korvrig is charged with spying on China's state secrets for foreign organizations of which the circumstances are particularly serious. His behavior violates the provision of Article 111 of the Criminal Law of the People's Republic of China. The facts are clear and the evidence is sufficient. He should be investigated for criminal responsibilities for the crime of spying on the state secret intelligence for overseas organizations. We are, of course, disappointed with the decision and the next step taken by the Chinese in the case of the two Michaels. And we offer all our support and sympathies to the family of Michael Kobrik and Michael Spavo, who are obviously living in a difficult moment today, as they have been for well over a year with the arbitrary detention of two Canadian citizens. We have continued to express our disappointment with the Chinese decision, with the Chinese detention of these two Canadians. Much of Asia is preparing to witness the annular solar eclipse on Sunday, June 21st. The phenomenon is often called a ring of fire eclipse because, unlike a normal eclipse, the moon doesn't fully cover the sun, leaving a rim of golden sunlight still visible. According to NASA, views of the eclipse will begin in Central Africa around 3.50 GMT on Sunday, then move east through Ethiopia, Yemen, Oman, Pakistan, parts of India and China. Chiayi City in Taiwan, which is expecting to have maximum views of the phenomenon, is holding a public event at a park where people can observe the entire process. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief, but you can find these and many other stories on our website at tellysoenglish.net. And you can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Tellysoenglish, I'm Katrina Goss, and thank you for watching.